Welcome to talking about one of the most important topics we can talk about as those with ADHD and the people who love us. So the first thing I want to say is I, full disclosure, am not perfect. I am just the person who spends all my time thinking about how to unpack this and how people can be social. And to be truthful, I wasn't a kid who understood everyone. I was kind of a grandma. I really liked to watch videos about Miss Marple, Hercule Poirot, Sherlock Holmes, and I really didn't understand everyone. As a matter of fact, my mantra was that everybody should try to understand me, but that doesn't really work out. So my first lesson and the first step in our roadmap toward connection is actually the first lesson I had to learn, and I'd love for everyone to join me at home. When I say happy birthday to, I want everyone to shout you. If I say knock, knock, you would say, who's there? If I clap, right, you'll probably mirror that. We mirror the social aspects around us, right? Models are the way we learn everything as human beings. If your grandma ever said, monkey see, monkey do, the reason they said that wasn't just a groundbreaking study by Albert Bandura, it was because we see stuff and we copy it. Babies see you walk and they copy it. And one of the things that we struggle with as people with ADHD is actually mirroring the group. Why? Partly because we don't pause to pay attention, right? But partly because it's not our mindset. And I know it didn't used to be my mindset. So when you think about how to connect with everyone, I want us to start from the baseline of understanding the social world and the way it works. And then you can make your choices. You know, we don't get there the same way that everyone else gets there as people with ADHD. We get there a little bit differently, but we do get there. And so how you get there may not be a linear process, but I really want to give you this roadmap. We have to use our strengths and we have to start to pause and look around us and notice what people are doing. Part of the benefit of mirroring the group is that we start to understand social norms and we start to understand the unspoken world rules of the social world. And we're going to have a little video in a minute where one of my young friends um, tells you about the social world and how to observe it. We watch social models and we adapt our behavior. So that's just something that I really want to start talking about from the very beginning of this talk. One of the things that happens as I go through life and as I work with people, if I talk to someone's boss or coworkers, if I'm out in the community speaking with people, if I'm working with a child or a teen or a young adult, I hear from the people in their lives, right? I talk to teachers and coaches, and one of the things that they say to me often is people are sending social messages and they are not picking them up. So if you do nothing today, I would love for you to start looking for those social messages, and I'm going to tell you how. Are there unspoken rules in Fortnite, things that you do and don't do that maybe aren't written down anywhere? Yeah. Yeah. So what are some of the unspoken rules in Fortnite and like, how do you know? It's kind of just you and you end up doing it once and then you realize people get mad at you. So then you stop doing it. Yeah. <laughs> so wait, you're telling me something brilliant that will fit into another lesson, which is you're telling me that you see the person's reaction to my action and then yeah so if you see the person's reaction to your actions in Fortnite, like what kind of things do they do can you show me they just kind of get annoyed i don't know um but the thing ahmad tells us that i think is just wonderful is that he says you watch people and if they get in trouble stop doing it. 
and he had many examples when we spoke. I've been making a series of videos this year for a group called Choose Love as a fundraiser for them. And they, the videos are, are a, a program to show parents how they can teach social emotional learning. And Ahmad was one of my favorite kids. I'd never met him before. But one of the wonderful things he tells me about is how people get in trouble and basically these social messages, that there are all these social messages and that they're out there. And if you pause and you step back and you watch other people, and I know easier said than done, you're going to actually see what people do. And if they get in trouble, don't do that. Um, one of the things I think that's very true about um, everyone is that we sometimes don't pay attention to those social messages and we sometimes don't mirror. But if you take nothing away and you start working on nothing else, I would love for you to take that away, is to start with the social messages and to start mirroring whatever environment, right? Um, we hang back a little bit and pause and watch other people. And we're gonna be talking about that a lot today. So one of the things that's also difficult that I heard, we heard Ahmad talk about basically shifting his mindset, right? Lesson two is shift your mindset. So being social is hard work. And one of the stories I often hear from my ADHD clients of all ages is this idea that everyone else socializes easily and that they find it hard to socialize. Well, here's the only thing. There are thousands of business books written basically about social communication. And so they wouldn't make those books if people weren't seeking that information. And so one of the things that I've done is I've done a ton of research on self-awareness and social learning, and people do work on this. So they have done studies that show that actually when people are the CEO of a company, leaders in a group, they spend a lot of time working on social communication, that it's not easy for them, that they have to work really, really hard at it. So one of the things I'd ask you to do is start to think about this instead of as it's really hard work for me and it's not hard for everyone else, is to understand that it, it is actually hard for everyone and we all are kind of exiting our comfort zone. So when people have a lot of self-awareness and emotional intelligence and they, they are building these skills, right, because this can be built, then they have the ability to understand their own values, passions, patterns, reactions, and they understand how those personality traits impact their actions, right? So again, going back to we need to pause to pay attention, um, sometimes we have to think about our strengths and take that bird's eye view and realize how our patterns and personality traits come in. So for example, if you are a person like me and you're very efficient, sometimes we issue social relationships in favor of efficiency and we might break too many eggs. So we have to know that about our personality traits. Um, there's also an aspect of bias here, right? We use autobiographical information, our own life experiences, and we use that experience to walk into other people's shoes and hopefully to step in their shoes. And we're going to talk about how to do that a little later and to think about, well, if I've had this experience and they're having this experience, um, how do we, how do I understand them? And that's one way that we show empathy and we understand other people and we show how we feel. Um, but there's a bias there, right? Because I haven't lived your life and you haven't lived my life and there's experiences we haven't had. The other piece is that studies show that people who have self-awareness and high emotional intelligence have been working on all these aspects. That the CEOs of companies, the really productive leaders that we admire, the people who really are out there changing lives, are people who spend a lot of time wondering about their perspective and trying to work through those biases and make sure that they really understand other people and what they're going through. So this is where I go back to, I'd love for us to just shift our mindset out of it's only hard for us and understand that although there are many things about ADHD that make this hard and I completely validate that, it's actually hard for everyone. The other thing is let's use our superpower. 
we are fun, we have great creativity and some other wonderful characteristics, and we can gamify this process. So one of the things I love to do with clients is that we predict how people will react. So Monday morning, I'm gonna go into work. I want you to sort of put in your envelope, in your mental envelope, how will someone react to uh, cutbacks? Something's not come in on time. Uh, something isn't what they expected, right? You can do this at school. You can do this with your child. Um, we notice how people react to things, then we have a greater chance of understanding how we will react and we also have a greater understanding of how they're gonna take that information or those social messages and react to what we're saying. So all of these things build that muscle where you understand and get along with people better because you're spending the time to be able to predict. And we don't have to drive ourselves crazy about this. I know as a champion ruminator, I am completely sympathetic to those of you who are thinking, I need to think about things less. If you need to think about things less, <laughs> ignore this. But what really happens is we need to think about what the situation calls for. And the more we can sort of build that reading of people and what they will feel about certain situations, the better off we are. Now, all of this is pushing us out of our comfort zone. It is uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable when we do anything that makes change. And I wanna completely validate that. So the first question I want you to ask yourself is, what makes this hard? You know, being uncomfortable is an emotional experience, just as boredom is an emotional experience for us agitated boredom, right? When we feel like we're gonna jump out of our skin. So leaving your comfort zone, we're gonna talk about a little later, doesn't have to mean that you completely change everything about your social approach today. What it could mean is that you dip your toe in the water a little bit and you start looking at what do I do that makes this palpable and what do I do that makes me able to cope with this and how much do I stay in my comfort zone and when do I start to leave my comfort zone a little and we're going to talk about how to dip your toe in the water but I want to acknowledge that all of this does push you out of your comfort zone all right here's the thing the things that help us with social connection are hard for people with ADHD so we struggle many times with a few things, and I've sort of gathered them from years of experience. Chit chat. Many of you might raise your hand and say, I find chit chat super boring. Many of you might struggle with listening, right? We don't listen, we're talking over everybody. Um, avoiding pursuing campaigning. Um, I admit that I was a champion campaigner, so I have children who are champion campaigners. What campaigning means is um, when I wanted a Barbie dream house, I would literally follow my mother around. Um, if your child wants to go somewhere, if you want something, you relentlessly pursue it at the cost of everything else. Um, showing up for others, right? It's very hard for us sometimes to text people to remember to be reciprocal. Um, paying attention to those social messages we've been talking about. Joining in, right? It's very daunting. I actually have just put a bunch of videos about people actually physically joining into a group on my website because it's something that people are calling for. It's really hard to join a group and to physically navigate that. Being on a team, right? Sometimes working that cooperatively with other people, self-regulating, it's really hard. But all of these things contribute to our ability to connect and engage with people. So we need them to build relationships even though they are things that you might find hard. I want to make a sales pitch for chit chat, for instance. Chit chat has a purpose. In order to nurture connection and to nurture relationships, we have to bond. We have to have that shared experience. So when we chit chat, it might feel boring to us as people with ADHD. It might not feel like something we want to do, but we find out about people. We feel them out. We detect common interests. 
we build trust and intimacy so that we can move forward without oversharing or without pushing the boundaries of that relationship. We share likes and dislikes. So chit chat and other social functions that may be difficult for us, we can find our own way of doing it, make it a game, and we're gonna talk about how do we do this in a very ADHD friendly way but they are, have a purpose, and that purpose is to nurture their relationship. If we don't do them, then we're not able to nurture those relationships, and then we miss out on the connection. So I totally validate that they're difficult, but I wanna sort of make the sales pitch for having a purpose. However, some of you are probably sitting there thinking, I don't know how to chit chat, I don't know how to, to make those connections, and I don't really, um, fully understand people and their motives. Enter social spy. So I had to make a bunch of choices and I really want to say that I, if you take nothing away, social spy is the thing to take away from this presentation. The concept of social spy is that we become more self-reflective, that you actually become a social sleuth who watches people without directly watching them that you will go to a mall, a food court, your office, your children go to school, and they will observe, notice, and spy. Because I think I speak for many of us when I say we may not be the most observant people, and we may not always notice and spy on people. So when we are actually able to spy, we're able to notice more detail and more information about people, and it actually contributes to allowing us to do things like chit chat. So spy helps you watch and observe, we rehearse, we practice, we self-correct, all the ways that we learn new social things, we do by observing through spy. Here's my little spy guy. We can use this at any age, I have many tweets from people who read Wild Know and Play With Me as adults and have been doing the social spy thing in, in many venues across the country and across the world. The idea is that we need to watch people to find out about them. So if you don't know what to chit chat about with them, if you're not sure what they're about, if you're not sure if there's someone you can trust or that you can approach, that we would use social spy to collect information and use that information to empower you. Every year when school starts, I use social spy with all of my clients because I get the, you know, 45 page rubric with all the information about a teacher where the teacher spends two pages on fonts. And kids who don't read the room don't necessarily take that information, maybe they don't even read it, right? And say to themselves, well, wait a minute, this is information telling me that this teacher seriously cares about the fonts. So I have them go to school and I have them spy and I have them collect information about the teacher and learn how to read the teacher. The same thing can be done for adults, right? What are your boss's values? What do they care about? What are the things that they repeat over and over again? Um, how do they feel about fonts? This also helps you with social connection, right? So if you have struggles moving from saying hi to someone to moving toward a full-fledged relationship, then that pathway is going to mean that you need information. The more you spy and collect information, the more you can use that information to inform your conversations with them. And it really can be done. I do it with all kinds of people and no one, knock on wood, has ever been caught spying. Um, this social sleuth concept also allows us to build that muscle of stepping into other people's shoes. Because now I'm noticing what's going on in other people's lives. So. If someone has had a death in the family, God forbid, or has had something going on in their life, if I've been spying and I've been noticing and I've become more observant, then I'm not going to go in their office and start venting about, you know, the fax machine or the copy machine rather being broken. I'm going to observe and notice and share experiences with them, and that adds to our future conversations. So. I have a video um, of, of a kid rehearsing spy, and really it's just a simple idea that we can do where we can rehearse 
and then come back. And it's imperfect. And I wanted to show this to you because I wanted you to see just how sort of imperfect it is, that it's not necessarily, you know, something that you have to do where your kid is, you know, uh, in the actual school building. So um, this is a dining room and I'm asking this kid to spy. We'll see if we can make this work. Okay, so if you were at your locker and you were pretending to spy, can you show me what you would do? I can't open it, I need help. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how would you be at your locker but spying on other kids? Awesome. So when we spy, we aren't necessarily going to um, have all the, you know, all, all the fancy things of getting to practice in the school. Right now, many kids don't even have lockers. If you're going to spy and you're an adult, you're going to a food court or something, you know, you're just going to sit with your iPad, sit with your phone, sit with your cup of coffee and observe. But spy can be an incredible way that we build that muscle of noticing, especially if those social messages sometimes pass us by and we just don't pay attention to them. One of the reasons I care about these social messages is that there are cultural and social norms wherever we go, right? So these are unwritten expectations that we have that are, you know, in the workplace, in schools, in people's homes. A lot of my little friends don't get asked back for playdates because they go in and they don't read the environment and they jump on the couch and they take their shoes and put them everywhere and then this is an issue. So a long time ago, I started working on social spy with kids so that they would go into different environments and bring back the information on the social norms. The same can be said of any place we go. If we were in person this year, I would be saying to all of you, and we've done this actually as a social skills lab in the past, where we are looking for the social norms of the ADHD conference, right? We want to look at those social expectations and they vary. Saying th thank you is a big thing in some cultures. Other cultures, you don't say thank you. Taking off shoes is a, is a really something that people do in certain households in certain places. Um, going to lunch with your coworkers, right? So in certain offices, if you say no to going to lunch, people might feel that you're kind of um, brushing them off and it's really not done. So I want to say that the spy element can really help you as you're trying to navigate this social world and understand and look at people's expectations. Part of this is nonverbal communication. So <laughs> recently someone said to me that 70% uh, of information is nonverbal and why would you ever ignore that data? And I want to say to you, that is 100% what I, I feel. Um, one of the things that I hear often when I talk to coaches and teachers and coworkers of my clients is that they have been sending social messages with their body to let someone know that it's enough or I'm not interested in talking, but they don't want to actually say it because they feel like that would be so hurtful and then they're baffled. Right. So here's what I want to say. Neurotypicals are trying to send us the message and we need to pick up what they're putting down, because when they're sending us these messages of nonverbal communication, that's their way of telling us how they feel about different things. And by the way, it could be positive as well. It could be that they're letting you know overtures that they would like to pursue connection and friendship with you. But because we're not paying attention and because we're not spying, we don't necessarily notice and keep in, and keep noticing that information. So <laughs> I love this picture, which a, a parent kindly allowed me to share, because I think if we read this body language, we can definitely know that this young person wants us to stay away. Right. So these kinds of body signals tell people how to be and how to react to us. And we send them out too. But when someone has their foot 
pointed to the right and they're sort of exiting a conversation, if we don't notice and we don't spy and see what are the social communications that they use with their body and voice specific to them, right? So Monday morning, you're going to go in and you're going to spy on your boss and you're going to make sort of a little inventory. What do they do with their body and voice to other people when they're feeling certain things so that you can then adapt and react to them, not in a way that gets us in our head and gets us ruminating, but just to know that those are their tells, right? Those are the things that they're sharing with us. And that sharing is incredibly important. All right, so I have another little video. So I want everybody at home to think about this. As you watch this video, you can wonder, is this person receptive to talking to me? Um, and I'll let you judge. I won't even tell you. Hi, Craig. Hey. Um, I had a question for you. Uh, sure. So you can see from the video that this person is not necessarily receptive to talking to me, right? They're into their uh, slides and they're doing their thing and they're on their computer. And this is the kind of feedback I get when I work with adults. Um, often people will say, you know, I try to send them the message that this isn't a good time, their bosses and their coworkers, and they don't see or read that message. So one of the things you can do to improve your social communication is just start working on watching the social messages and really make a little inventory of everybody you know and what messages they're trying to send you. Because this person was clearly at their computer. Um, they actually were not interested in me speaking. They were definitely into their concentration, not trying to be rude, but they weren't welcoming me, right? There was no overture of beckoning me forward. So I want to show that to you because I think it's a good example of the kind of thing that if we pause and we by, then we're going to notice and we're not going to have that self-regulation hangover, right? So many times as people with ADHD, we don't pay attention to those signals and then we feel really bad and we ruminate on the things we did and didn't do and how we didn't interact. So part of your social journey might be that you hang back a little bit or you encourage your child to hang back a little bit and to observe that body language and then react to it. So the big step four is learn to read body language. We want to also map other people's emotions and see how those emotions show up in their body and voice. Um, reading the mood is a huge piece of why will no one play with me and some of the other materials that I've put out since then because we adapt our conversation and our interactions based on someone's mood, which they show with their body language. And we can learn to detect that. And so that's a really great way to avoid feeling bad and avoid sort of the mishaps that might come along. So a really quick, easy exercise you can do as an adult, as a parent, is to pick five people and watch them and note their body language and play a game. Try to predict what they're gonna do. Try to predict what each of these signals tells us and you know, just keep note of it in your head or in your phone and really try to start to understand how they're showing you their, their perspective and mood. If you think back to the slide I had of the young man who's eating his cereal and clearly not interested in anything that we have to offer, right? He's trying to tell us with his body and he's not saying any words. Um, he's really just trying to show us how he feels. And if we were to rush in, which many of my clients do, um, and and to invade him and start talking to him and chatting him up, he's not a morning person, um, he would not react um, in, in a positive and receptive way. So we want to watch those things because then we're going to have a better social connection. One of the things I want to note about this picture is that this young woman, um, if we were noticing her as I approach her, she actually took her earbud out. And so when she took her earbud out, that was a sign, right? A little social message that she is willing to speak with me. So those are the things we want to look for because if she is receptive to me, then I can go forward. If not, then I can say, oh, is this not a good time?
The biggest other message in step five is to know thyself. So we want to have an understanding of what we do in different situations and our own inner emotional life. Many people with ADHD and without can't really predict their own reactions to things and have a difficult time identifying their own emotions. We can understand other people better if we understand ourselves. Now, I know for ruminators, we often get stuck in that cycle. And one of the things I would say is that we get stuck in these why questions. And one of the best things I've ever uh, taught my clients to do is to stop asking why, because we really can't know. I can't know why this other person has reacted in a certain way or why they haven't texted you back. But when we get stuck in that rumination cycle, we also stop watching for social cues and we become more inward. So I wanna ask you all a question, which is, do you think that you're a person who rushes in? Do you ruminate and get stuck? Are you an avoider? One of my clients I'm gonna talk about in a minute used to call it cocooning, where she would just avoid and avoid and avoid. And you know, it was so hard for her to connect socially and to reach out that she just found that she was better cocooning herself away. So if we look at our past patterns as we get to know ourselves and we think of, of this step, which is know thyself, we're gonna also think of understanding our inner emotional life, right? We're trying to understand our emotions and understand other people's emotions and sort of understand the topography of things, right? I have my map, you have your map, where are we meeting in the middle and what is going on for you and what's going on for me? Um, to understand how others are acting, we kind of have to understand our own inner emotional life and how we react to things. And this is something that a lot of times that mind-body connection that's so important um, is sort of missing for people with ADHD where we have to develop it to recognize emotions in others and then to recognize our own emotions and how our lens is skewed or biased by our own emotions, right? So when we're in that heightened ruminative state, when we're experiencing rejection sensitivity, when we're experiencing fight, flight, or freeze, it does alter our lens, right? Everything feels intense. Everything feels big. Everything feels like a slight or injury. Well, the more we can predict our own reactions, the more we can predict the outcome and we can predict how other people will react and we can actually learn what we need to modulate and what we need to cope so that we aren't stuck in the horrible feeling that these emotions can make us experience. So I'm suggesting you create your own emotional dashboard. Because I feel X, then I do Y. Because I feel X, I need to do Y, right? I need to do certain things to cope with my emotions. What makes me feel at ease? What makes me thrive? How, how is it that I thrive? What do I need? What words or action shows I'm in a good mood or what words or actions do I take when I'm particularly not in a good mood and maybe I'm having one of those emotional spins? What do I need to be successful? So I think this is one of the biggest messages of this, which is that it doesn't matter what anyone else needs to be successful. What do you need to be successful? And by successful, I mean to have that emotional state of calm. You know, when we go into fight, flight, or freeze, we are ancient in our brains. And the body thinks that a saber-toothed tiger is coming to attack us. And so our brain, our limbic system, and our thalamus are just doing their job. They're on high alert. And they're alerting us to whatever is happening, whether it be a slight, whether it be something that is really dangerous. And they're allowing us to know and feel that alert. So we have to kind of know our past patterns, our triggers. Are we vulnerable to stress? And help ourselves find ways to quiet the thalamus, whether it's that we use some havening, whether it's that we use mindfulness and other techniques, but we, we 
when we are in that fight, flight, or freeze situation, it is definitely difficult to have someone like me ask you to take steps socially. And so that stress and having that emotional dashboard and knowing what you need to do as sort of a pregame is really important as we prepare to make more connections and have this social journey. And it's as I said, I could talk for an entire day about it. I'll just mention this is the limbic system and there's the, the, the different elements that contribute toward this wonderful flight, flight and freeze. So part of what we're gonna do now is talk about dipping our toe in the water. Because one of the things I really wanted to do with this talk was to give people a roadmap. Do you know, there was a study at a University of Chicago that showed that 40% of people researched said that they felt that if they talked to a stranger, no one would speak back to them. And yet, when they researched and polled strangers, so to speak, 100% of those people said if someone spoke to them, they would speak back. Some of what has to happen is that we're going to go on this journey for more connection and we're going to change our mindsets and we're going to find these coping mechanisms, but we're going to dip our toe in the water. When people normally ask us, especially high anxiety people or people who are subject to a lot of uh, rejection sensitivity, to go forward and to really reach out socially, they often ask us to do very insurmountable things. As parents, I know we're all guilty of this. We say to our kids, go to school, join something, talk to all these people. Why aren't you having people over? As adults, why aren't you doing you know, more, talking to people, go to that cocktail party, go up and meet strangers. But it's very daunting. So I'm going to take a lesson from the hundreds of people I've worked with in order to look at how can we do this in a way that dips our toe in the water and that isn't us rushing in and it isn't us avoiding. So I mentioned that one of my clients called it cocooning. She said that she would get into moods where she didn't socialize at all, this uh, young woman, and she found that she wasn't comfortable in her own skin. And we had to sort of start designing a pregame. So what I did in preparation for this talk today was I went through every folder of everyone I have worked with and looked at what were the small ways we dipped our toe in the water and how did this work so that I could give you all a roadmap. So the first thing is that um, I made a video with Jessica McCabe, How to ADHD, about rejection sensitivity. And there's a lot out there now on it. And it is a very real thing. And part of the issue is that intensity of emotions, right? And so I wanted to just share that I'm terrified is a very real feeling people have. And that part of these tools can be to how, how can you find coping mechanisms and, and calm that thalamus. One of the ways is self-talk. So a lot of times our natural inclination in the brain is to go towards self-talk that is very negative. So the first thing you might do as you're trying to dip your toe in the water is to think about self-talk. Everybody right now, think about the last message you said to yourself. Was it positive? Was it negative? I'm hoping it was positive, but a lot of times research shows it's negative. Self-talk is the backbone of our self-regulation guidance system, of our self-awareness, and self-talk really helps you in your daily life as you step out of your comfort zone, become uncomfortable, and head toward um, greater social connection. So, this is just one little tidbit about self-talk, but I really think that self-talk might be part of the key. You're doing your best. You're trying the most you can. It didn't work out, but we don't know why. And instead of going into all the negative reasons to think about your strengths, your superpowers, take them and put them on a sticky at your computer. We're all at our computers too much and look at your strengths and the things you offer in friendship. The other thing is we have to practice. So as we dip our toe in the water, this is a practice arena. Now, 
I don't know about you all, but I tend not to practice things as a person with ADHD. Dr. Ned Hollowell has written about this a lot, where we don't practice things because it feels hard or boring for us. But I also want to give you permission to proceed here because practice is part of how things get better and get easier for you. But practice doesn't necessarily have to be something that it is an epic ask, like I said. And so when we think about building social emotional skills, we have to know that anything new we're learning, we have to observe social models using SPY, we have to think about how to do it, and we have to practice. So this is going to be imperfect, right? It might be that whenever you enter a new doorway, whenever you enter a Zoom room, you try to hold back a little bit and you try to practice listening more. It might be that you do something like say hello to a coworker. Share one idea in a meeting, right? If you're a person who rushes in, maybe you hold back most of your comments and you only add one idea. You greet someone right? Many times when people are thinking about practicing these social skills, we're talking about these big ideas. I want you, if you are really scared, and this is really hard for you, to think about smaller baby steps, dipping your toe in the water. You add a comment to a conversation, right? And all the time that we're doing these things where we're exiting our comfort zone and we're practicing, we're also practicing building the skills, maybe with a friend, maybe with a coworker, maybe we do try to build an entire conversation as our practice, but knowing that we're in the practice zone, that this is not something we're judging or looking for perfection. If any of you have ever learned to catch a ball, to you know, run a mile, you don't run the mile the first day, right? You, t you run half a mile, then you run three-fourths of a mile, then you run a mile, then you run two. So when we tend to think of these things, we tend to think of them in very daunting terms. But I would love to ask you to realign that expectation. Realign it for your children who are probably terrified, and I'm going to talk about how they can practice in a second, and realign your expectation for yourself. Because who here expects too much of yourself, and then it seems insurmountable, and then we don't get to have that connection, right? We don't get to have that reciprocal socialization. So socialization is about being reciprocal, and it is about this practice and joining the conversation and nurturing that connection. So maybe you join your coworkers for lunch, but instead of expecting yourself to be someone who's, you know, dominating the conversation or having the best conversation ever, or, you know, contributing everything or, you know, having witty insights, you just join. You just go. And if you're an avoider, that's going to be your big step, right? That's your big practice is to actually go and join that conversation. For the kids, I want us to take some pressure off of them. We often as parents, and I am totally guilty of this, and as parents, all we can do is get up tomorrow and do better than we did today. It is, we are, it's an imperfect thing. But we often ask kids to do so much that then it feels daunting. And if people have thin social relationships and a thin social network, or they don't know how, right? I asked you at the beginning of this talk to try to think of this rather than with judgment, but that if we could, we would. And so instead of asking them to practice whatever skills you're building with them in a way that is very daunting, we're gonna dip their toe in the water. We're gonna add to a conversation in class once. We're gonna add to a conversation in a small group. Speak to someone in the hall. And by speak to someone in the hall, I don't mean waving at them and saying, hey, and having some huge conversation. I literally mean as they pass, saying, hey. Talking to someone at a family party or barbecue. We have safe environments in our lives, all of us, and if 
we are trying to practice these greater social skills and this skill building, one of the ways we can do this is by having conversations in very safe environments. And yes, you as parents might have to be the host of the play date. You might have to be the host of that social arena. But if you can think of places that they go where they might add to a conversation, for instance, or they might practice holding back, or they might practice looking someone in the eye, and you can think of those family parties, barbecues, family friends, that is a place where I've had a lot of clients have a lot of success. And once they have that success in that arena, now it's much easier for them to generalize or try at school or try at a club. Resistance is a very real thing, and I don't like the word resistance because, again, I think we would if we could. But, you know, I've given many talks on that topic that really can help you also because I'm sure some of you are saying, well, I can't even get them to join a club. We want to pick a conversations when two groups are talking. So this applies for adults as well as kids. Uh, many times there's two groups talking and my, my clients get very overwhelmed by these two juxtaposition conversations and they're not sure what to do. And when those two conversations are going on, they just sit silent. And I don't know if any of you can relate to this, but there's something really horrible about being a little bit of a ghost where you feel like people don't notice you or people aren't really engaging with you. And so when I have clients who really have a hard time chatting with other people, joining a conversation, and they are prone to cocooning, I really encourage them that their one arena of practice for the day is to just pick between those two conversations, pick one and allow the other one to go on and actually to cope with those distractions. I mean, many of you are probably at home saying, oh my goodness, that's just so hard because I can hear the other person talking. That might be the practice, right? How do I filter out another conversation and actually pay attention and be present? Not easy. Speak up twice in class now. So the first time they went and they spoke up once, now we're gonna speak up twice. Speak up before homeroom or in class or when someone's talking to you or somebody you like in class, right? So now I'm, I'm starting to move forward. I'm upping the ante. They had this one small thing, now they're gonna do two bigger things. And that way we're building that practice muscle. So I made this slide to show this idea of how this process all works, because I, I really am the how-to lady, so I really want to show you how. When we're practicing, we create a single mission. That is a single objective, and that literally can be small. I'm working on practicing that skill of building a conversation. And that little graphic is my building a conversation graphic from why I will know and play with me. And I'm going to create the single mission of adding to the conversation. I've been at home practicing that skill of building the conversation. And then I'm going to pick a specific place in step three where I'm going to actually build that conversation or add to the conversation. And then, and this is where I really experienced this with my clients, that anxiety pops up. And maybe the first time you did it, it was great. And then you're flooded with that anxiety, flooded with that fight, flight, or freeze, flooded with fear. Now we come back and we have to create some kind of pregame, some kind of coping mechanism. We have to get to the bottom of what caused that anxiety. And maybe it's the negative self-talk and we need to adjust the self-talk, right? Maybe it was the expectations, maybe it was too daunting. Maybe you were trying to do this around people who aren't favorable towards you or who you don't feel safe with. And then we create a coping mechanism and then we go back in and we practice the skill. So throughout all of this, we're fluctuating between that practice zone, picking a skill, practicing in the real world what we're working on, and then fluctuating back to cope with anxiety and the real things that come up. I wanted to share this because it's something that practitioners do, but most people don't talk about. And one of the things that people, hundreds of people have written to me over the past few years about is 
what do you do about this practice zone? What do you do about this concept that people are actually struggling to practice? And so I wanted to share with you how it works. So one of the other tips I have as we're wrapping up is to have a job. One of the things I've found over the years is if you have a reason, an excuse to talk to people, it's a lot easier to make those connections. When you have those shared experiences, right? All the people volunteering to put on this conference know each other. They were joking before. They know things about each other. They're in the trenches together this week. And they've been in the trenches together all year. So whether you're an adult or you're a parent trying to coach your child, Having a job and, and an excuse to talk to people is an absolutely fabulous way to find these practice zones. Yearbook, newspaper, managing a team, being a videographer on a team, being a volunteer at a church, a conference, an organization, gives you an excuse to meet with people, connect with them, have shared experiences, and nurture those relationships. And one of the kids I work with has been starting a club and actually it's gone really well. And so I've used this with many, many other people where they actually start something that they're interested in. And then you know how the ADHD brain is. Interest is our absolute fuel. I want to say as we come to a close that to me, friendship and relationships are the most important thing and is something we all deserve. It is not necessarily a seamless process for people with ADHD, and it may be something we do have to work on. I love this C.S. Lewis quote, that friendship is born in the moment when one person says to another, you too, I thought I was the only one. Whatever you are struggling with or whatever you are working on or your child is, you are not the only one. There are thousands and thousands of people feeling the same way and working the same way. And so I hope that this talk is moving you toward that feeling of empowerment because hundreds and hundreds of people that I've worked with and now people who've read Why Will No One Play With Me have used these materials and have actually found a greater chance at connection and have changed their whole social outlook. And it starts with that desire that we have for the connection and for realigning our expectations. If you take nothing away, please take away that practice zone and those small ways that we can reach out and practice. So we do have a few questions for you. Okay, great. So the first one is, what is the difference between autism spectrum and ADHD when it comes to social cue? That's a great question. So um, there are recent studies that show, um, so first of all, the CDC finds that 14% of people with ADHD actually have the, are on the autism spectrum as well. I think there is a difference in terms of understanding of the social world, um, and there's definitely a difference in terms of um, there are some people with ADHD who can completely read social cues. We just don't pause to pay attention to do it. And then there is a great population within ADHD, and this is supported by research, who actually do not read social cues easily and who do not like people with autism step into other people's shoes and understand them um, and have what's called theory of mind, a greater understanding of other people's inner emotional life. I think the biggest distinction is whether or not um, someone actually can, when they pause and pay attention, whether they can read social cues or whether or not they are um, struggling to read those cues, the body language, and to understand and step into people's shoes. Um, I don't think the actual, you know, diagnostic label um, is as important as that distinction. The next one is, how do we balance being intentional about connecting socially in ways that are effective with being ourselves or not losing our sense of who we are? You know, I think who we are and our intent and the wonderful things about ourselves should be something embraced by other people. Um, and we have tremendous strength. And one of the things I would say is, you know, friendship should be reciprocal. And many times uh, people with ADHD are 
people pleasers because we've been treated badly and are taking things from other people we shouldn't take. I think that's losing yourself, right? To adapt to people isn't necessarily losing yourself because you're being more empathetic and kind to them and you're having more of a real connection. And I think the key is know thyself, right? And that's why I included it as one of the steps. If you know who you are and you've really thought about your own foibles and the things you bring to friendship and the things maybe that you want to, you know, alter and, and twist and turn so that you're a better friend, that to me is very different than I'm going to adapt and throw away everything I am so that I can fit in with someone. What if you've asked your kids to use a social spy and they end up mirroring what you don't want them to do, but it's totally normal behavior amongst the group? So parents worry about peers and those models is absolutely a valid concern. Um, but that's where I think that we as parents forget the absolute um wonderful relationship we have with our children. And I think that's where I would love you to spy with your children as well. So sometimes kids do have awe or love of people who don't necessarily put forward positive social behaviors or who aren't doing the things you as a parent would like them to do. And they're not necessarily making good choices. So that can happen. But the thing I've found that happens the most is that kids see someone, for instance, you've told them a thousand times, to please self-regulate, that when they're too much, it hurts someone, that, you know, they're, they're, you know, rude to you, rude to their brothers and sisters, and you get nowhere. And then they see someone be really, really, uh, you know, dysregulated in a store, and they start to realize, wow, that doesn't look great. So what I would say is that, um, if you spy with them and partner with them and continually discuss and use the open question format that I have um, talked about a lot, where instead of saying, look at that, you know, that person isn't behaving the way you want, you would just ask them, what do you think of how that person is? So when they come home and they're telling you about a friend who you don't necessarily love the way the friend is behaving, instead of jumping in to tell, which makes the friend the forbidden fruit, I would recommend asking questions. What do you like about them? What is it that the person is doing as a friend? How do they treat people? What do you think about how they treat people? And allow your child to have that self-reflective experience. And this is really hard. I'm not unaware of that. Um, because we want to make sure that they are looking at positive social models, but they're going to look at both sometimes. And that way we are coaching and guiding them out of it. Speaking of kids, how do you help your kids who shut down after their social practice doesn't go well? So this is something I've, you know, wanted to, to spend a day talking about, too. Um, one of the reasons kids shut down and avoid is because they feel like things don't work out and that they can't. So one of the reasons that I'm advocating these small social baby steps is because then there's less of a chance that they feel like it's daunting. They've tried to do something that is really, really far out of their comfort zone, and it hasn't worked out. The greatest thing that I do is to remind them of the social connection that they want, their strengths, and to find ways for them to re-enter that practice arena that are much smaller baby steps because I have never had a kid who just says hey to someone in the hallway, have it go really badly, and then retreat because it's a, such a small thing versus I want you to go, I want you to, you know, join in, I want you to participate fully, which is the kind of things we as parents say. We have good intentions, but that's a big step. In instances where someone might have ADHD and ASD traits, does the conforming to social norms and quote unquote reading the room contribute to a feeling of masking in those environments? Um, I don't think that we're going to mask anything by trying to read the room. And like I said, there are many people who have autism spectrum disorder as well as ADHD. Um, and really we're trying to help them understand and navigate the social world and shift their social mindset so they understand that these messages are happening and that the messages are are being sent to tell them something um so i don't find that it masks i find that they start to 
um, actually have the awareness of everything that's going on. And by the way, as they read the room better, they may go through a period of self-consciousness. Um, and that's why we have the coping mechanisms that we're going to work with them to make sure that they feel better and don't judge themselves and know that we're all practicing and we're all working on something. Do you recommend gamification for social skills? And if you do, which ones do you use or recommend? I do recommend gamification for social skills. I usually <laughs> make up my own games um, and I usually make up games with kids. The kids I work with are super creative. They're bright, they're, uh, they're wonderful. And sometimes we collaborate. But what I tend to do is um, rather than board games or actual games in the marketplace, I tend to make up games like, you know, we're gonna put you know, this person, we're going to put this prediction in an envelope and you're going to go see what happens and spy and come back and tell me. Um, and we tend to um, make up games together. How do you spy on others without becoming too hyper vigilant? Excuse me. How do you toe the line between observing and overthinking to the point where you miss the chance for connection because you are too worried about reading social messages? That's an excellent question. So here's what I'd like to just make a distinction on. When I'm asking a kid to have a spy mission, they're not actually trying to have social connection. Their only objective for that lunch, for instance, or for that moment in the hallway, or for, you know, they're going into a sport and they're riding the bus and they're actually spying on something in a specific way. I'm asking that to be their mission. I'm, and, if, and if they have to abandon the spy mission and favor of social connection, obviously, I'd be all for that. But they're not being asked, you know, to keep up both. Um, and it's really something quick. You're talking about 20, 30 seconds. Um, when someone's trying to figure out what do people talk about, for instance, they might go two or three times to different settings that we pick um, to collect enough information so that we can we can work on what do they need to know in popular culture and what are these people's interests. Um, and what I would say is it is very hard to split your attention. So that's why the spy mission is sort of separate for the mission for connection. How can masking affect how we perceive the body language of others and how can we remove that bias? So we all have bias. You know, I, I can't remember how many there are, but 28, 30 biases. Um, and I think what happens is that sometimes we become so in our heads that we don't notice the body language and we're we're so self-conscious. Um, we also might have a certain emotional reasoning lens where we're, we're emotional, we're experiencing that heightened emotion, that intensity of emotions. And we the more we get to know ourselves and know that we're in that state and can feel that in our bodies because it's a very specific feeling um, individual to each person the more we'll know that we're looking at things through that lens and that we're not necessarily looking at things with the, the correct perspective and maybe have a game plan for when you're in that state how do you react and you know do you maybe hold back your comments or um or you know don't rush into things and what can you do to really go back to you know uh, a state out of fight flight or freeze and bring yourself and your self-regulation back to calm <laughs>